Great. It's terrific to be here. Um, thank you, Lori and uh, Dr. Norden and Dr. Petronovic for planning this and bringing scientists together to, to discuss what I think is the most important frontier. And each of you students, I want you to think about how do you know if you're smart or not? <laughs> and how do you define smart? And are you smart enough to last the rest of your life? Because as you heard in an earlier talk, every single day, your brain changes, every single moment, by what you learn. So I tell people, it's either moving forward or it's moving backward. So which way do you want your brain to go? And how you use your brain changes it. So you have to think very critically about what that is. And my interest in brain science really began 30 years ago by so many different individuals, and now I've seen over 30,000 uh, thinking about brain health. I mean, it's such a new term that we actually have a trademark on it because people don't think about, is my brain healthy or not, very much. But there was an individual uh, that was in a classroom that I started in autism, and he was 11 years old. He was labeled severely mentally retarded. And so I brought him into the class, and he watched me struggle with the tape recorder you know, day after day, and I'd taken it back in the old days, you had your tape recorders repaired instead of getting, the, getting a new one. Um, and he went, hmm, hmm. And he took this tape recorder apart and literally in 50 minutes had put it completely back together and it was working. And I said, this individual is labeled severely mentally retarded. Our understanding of the brain is so backward. And it was story after story that I saw an individual that was 17 who had made straight A's and then in middle school started struggling. And so they started looking for excuses. He had ADHD. He had dyslexia. There were all these things. This is why I'm not smart anymore. And we took him through some strategies of how to be innovative and abstract and learn ways to think, and his grades went back to A. But he had began to focus on his brain in a way that it was actually taking down his intellectual capacity. So think about this. I mean, we can fix hearts. We replace them. We can even restore deafness. But the human brain is where we have the most uncharted territory. We've learned more in the last two years. Being in this field for 30 years, years makes me so excited and stand on tiptoes because it's happening rapidly but not near, nearly fast enough. We've learned more in the last two years than all the years cumulative. And the science that you're hearing today is exploding. So indeed, we need to be wildly ambitious. And I loved it when they told me there would be students here because you are the future for us. And it's vital for us for you to think about how you neuroengineer your brain and don't wait and think, well, I've always got later to do that. Because as you've heard, our lifespan through medical science, is now double what our brain span is. We, you saw the baby. I love that picture. I might need that for my slide. Infants born today can well be expected to live to 100. Do you want to live to be 100 if your peak brain span is about 40? Or what if it declines sooner? Think about this. The dramatic doubling of the lifespan is the greatest achievement in the last century, and yet we've done nothing to move our brain spans forward to close this gap. Oh, and this right here is the, brain sp the lifespan going up, but look, oh my gosh, the Dow Jones average, our brain span is going slowly down, slowly down. Some of it starts in early 20s as well. And everyone is starting to look at what's wrong with your brain. You know, what's wrong when you have dyslexia? Or what's wrong when you have autism? Or what's wrong when you have concussions? So these are healthy aging studies. And we're involved in a lot of NIH, Department of Defense, studying because I'm interested in how we can increase the intellectual capacity regardless of whether your health or injury or disease. But these are healthy people 
Our whole brain blood flow, which I think may be a marker of brain health, for your body, you know lots of markers. You know, what's your cholesterol, what's your uh, blood pressure, what's your weight, uh, your body max. But we haven't really had any good brain markers of your brain moving to healthier states because we've looked so much at what goes wrong with your brain. And we know that as we age, we lose about 1.5% every decade starting in our 20s. Woo! That's not good starting in your 20s, and white matter tracks begin to decline in our 40s, and then functional connectivity. Now that our brain imaging is allowing us to see how fast do different regions of your brain talk to each other, we're no longer thinking of our brain in in clumps of frontal lobes or left brain, right brain. Our brain is talking in this rich network. The functional connectivity of speed of synchrony, look at what happens from 20-year-olds to 60s and 70-year-olds, the speed of communication drops. So we know these brain losses start early. So think about, you know, people think about Alzheimer's disease, and I say, I wish we would think about our brain in health, because we can do more in health than when a disease has set in. And the number one cause of cognitive decline is in healthy people because we let our brain decline. So I, let, I hope you like the word brainomics because think about it. And you've been hearing that you're going to be responsible for it, but you're also going to be paying for your own because in education, at least in the United States, you guys, in uh, European is a little bit ahead of our uh, teens in reasoning and college, but reasoning is at an, is at an all-time low. So the gross domestic product of of loss of academic achievement is costing us at both ends of the spectrum. Not just late life, but it's starting early. So I want to inspire you to think every single day, what am I doing for my brain? Big science is can go in so many directions. I mean, we can look at global warming. We can look at uh, alternate fuels or stem cells for cancer cures. But I can tell you, I hope each of you in this room will become one of the disciplines that is going to focus on solutions for brain, whether it's neuroengineering, neurophysics, bioinformatics, brain science, cognitive neuroscience, which is what I'm in. What used to be science fiction is now science faction. That you can literally, people didn't think I could be smarter. It's my genes. You either, your intellect, we thought, was what you're born with. People can change IQ points, 10 points, 20 points. Some of the things we're taught in terms of brain recovery, we used to think after one year, that was it. We've been able to show immense recovery 10 years, 20 years out. In healthy aging, there was a gentleman we worked with that was 83 who had a stroke. He was part of my dissertation. And he said, I can't go back to work. And I said, why not? And he said, well, I've had this stroke. And I said, well, you're still very smart. And he said, but my son is worried about me. And I said, your son wants you to get back to work. I'll work on him. We got him back to work, and he worked until the end of his life. We have this notion about being smart is very backwards in terms of what we can do. So I think the whole idea of retiring at 65 when we're going to live to be 95, in America, 65 was set because the average lifespan was 63. So it made sense, but why don't we update that if, if how we work matters? And so how do you know if your brain is resilient? Do you know if your body's resilient? I, we work a lot with high-performance uh, special operations command, the Navy SEALs, the uh, Army Rangers, and we're looking to build brain resilience and brain regeneration. We know if our body, the stronger it is, if you're weakened, you, you are going to rebound more from recovery. For the brain, we haven't really thought that much about your brain having resilience, but we know that it probably will precondition you so that when some of these dings happen, whether it's silent strokes or uh, general anesthesia or things that take you down, you're going to rebound quicker. So having resilience every single decade matters. And what about regeneration? I mean, we didn't know the brain 
made new neurons every single day till the day you died, except in the, uh, you mentioned the book, we now know it very clearly. You can work around a stroke, we can work around brain in injury, that our brain has so much redundant systems, the sky's the limit. The problem is, is that society in each of you limit your own brain capacity. I think it's interesting when people say, I'm a science major or an art major, we automatically think one's smarter than the other. Well, that's outdated. You know, when we blend these majors together, and I'm very uh, working hard on science, math, arts, engineering, technology, coming together to make our generation smarter. So our brain is the most complex engine ever designed. And it's right between your ears. And it drives everything we achieve. It's adaptable, it's repairable, and it's trainable. For me, that's exciting. And it's the brain imaging that is changing very dramatically for us to show it. We've been able to show cognitive change in individuals uh, after just short term. It's not like we train individuals hours. We show when we teach people strategies of how to do abstract thinking that we can change the brain using the imaging now in very amazing ways. So can, to what extent that we're asking can we increase brain resilience? How can you make sure that regardless if you're changing professions or something that happens to you that you'll rebound? And what are these mechanisms? Oops, uh-oh, excuse sorry. The mechanisms to regenerate, how can we harness those? And is there a limit to what can go wrong with what's happening? So what I'm interested in, and we've do, done a lot of clinical trials, randomized trials, uh, doing different types of training. We do high-performance brain training. I always tell people, who wants to go to a tutor or who wants to go to rehab, right? But if we say high-performance brain training, which is what it is, individuals will go. Because physical exercise, if you had to go to rehab versus high-performance physical training, it's different. So we're looking at randomized trials in cognitive training, physical exercise, and a lot of different combinations. And these are some of the questions that were asked. I'm a little afraid to say that we had some hypotheses based on uh, Richard's talk, uh, because I do think big data can help us to explore things that we never thought. And we're involved in a lot of studies now with bioinformatics to see what didn't we ask about their brain to look to address those. But will we get increases in brain blood flow by how people think? Can you neuroengineer your brain and you can increase brain blood flow that stays? Can we increase speed of functional connectivity? And what if by thinking you could increase the white matter of your brain? We've never really thought about that before. And do, do we improve more than just what you're trained in? It's very clear. Whatever you use your brain, you get better at. But what about generalized function? For me, the gold standard is, are you better in everyday life? Are you taking on more complex functions? Not do you do better on my uh, standardized test only. And then do the brain gains that we see correspond to cognitive gains? So in our statistics, we're interested in not baseline and then after midpoint and then later, and then we track people to see how long the, the measures last. So what I'm going to share with you is just one of the studies that was published in Cerebral Cortex. We had a recent paper come out in the frontiers of systems neuroscience, if you're interested in what about your own brain, that covered teen reasoning healthy people, 17 to 25, your frontal lobes is undergoing more change than any other time in our life in these frontal networks, except for the f first two months of life. And yet the type of things that we're doing to increase brain function and higher order thinking tends to be more rote, robotic, spit back information. You know, I love some of the questions. It's always like, how can I make my memory better? What if making your memory get better works against higher order thinking? To abstract, to be innovative, to see beyond the facts. And indeed, in some of our trainings, we teach people 
cold? How do you memorize everything? But we want to teach the brain to do what it was designed to do, which is be innovative, to abstract, to find new principles, to create new knowledge every single day. We see it in babies. We see it in five-year-olds in elementary. And then you go to middle school. You see these moon faces. Because, and I hope none of you are moon faces today. Because we're trying to say, here's facts, give us back facts, and that's what makes you smart. But it's not. It's your ability, and, and I love the stories here, to say, can you challenge to ask questions that we didn't even think about? So this was a healthy study. People 50 to 70, they weren't worried about Alzheimer's, no Alzheimer's in the family, completely screened out, and they were randomized either into uh, high-performance brain training, physical exercise, or weightless control. And I'm going to share with you what we found with when we taught them strategies to think. So, and we, the, they were trained, we started at baseline, we trained them one hour a week for six weeks and then six more weeks to, for 12 hours. And what we got, so time two right here is after six hours, we got significant brain blood flow, whole brain blood flow at rest with teaching people how to think in more complex ways. And it stabilized. It never went back down to zero when we checked them later. The neurophysicist that's working with us said, Sandy, I've never seen a medication do this. Physical activity doesn't do this. Something about using your neurons, and it makes sense if you think about it. Because when our muscles are working, it increases brain blood flow. Well, this is showing when you engage in complex thinking, it's actually making the brain blood flow increase. So then we began to ask, where is it happening? You know, and I said it couldn't have been a better place, linearly, in these frontal regions that has to do with abstraction, problem solving, decision making, which are a lot of the measures we do is where we saw the increases, as well as in these posterior regions, which is parietal, free association areas. So this... For us, and for the healthy people, 50 to 70, we were able to get them almost two decades back of brain health. Because remember what I said about brain blood flow? We start losing about 1.5% starting in our 20s every decade. So individuals were able to get back almost 8% and some even higher. Then we asked, well, what about speed of communication? across these functional networks. Now that we can measure that, we can look at the synchrony. And there's two major, there's three networks that have been identified. But we were interested in two, the default mode network, which is your network. If you're sitting here and you're daydreaming or thinking about where you're going for your party when we leave here, that's your default mode network. It's always working for you, whether you're at sleep. Our brain's always ready to do something. That's why in sleep we consolidate information. The central executive network is this part of the frontal lobes that associates with complex networks through the parietal lobes and does very rapid speed of communication. Healthy individuals were able to regain 30% of the speed of communication over this very short period of time. Remember, six hours, 12 hours, and it continued to get better. So... And it, what was interesting is, you know, we asked individuals, do you feel smarter? And they said, I feel, we talked about brain energy. They said, I feel more energetic. I feel like I don't take in so much information at such a low level, but I know how to go higher level. So then we wanted to say, what about white matter? So we looked, we put the seed regions. Now we can say, where in your brain would we think white matter integrity might get stronger? And indeed, we found that from this area in the hippocampus and the temporal lobe, which is your take information in, to the frontal lobes, which is your synthesizing, decision-making, judgment area, this white matter tract, the left uncinant, increased significantly, 14%, the integrity of the white matter. And we almost got it between the left and right uh, frontal lobes as well. So... Think about, this is what I want you to take away today as you think about this. Your intellectual capacity can change every single day. You can build the neural part of your brain to work better. 
But we wanted to see what about cognition? How did these individuals fare? So we have a whole battery of tests. And indeed, the measures that look at abstract thinking, switching, executive function got better. Memory, whoops, didn't get better right here because we didn't train memory uh, in this task. But in some of our studies, we actually see an increase in memory function as well. The third question we wanted to say is, do they relate to each other? You know, when you see these fancy scans, it's one thing to say, oh, the brain's changing. If I tell you your brain changes every single day by how you use it, well, then showing brain change is maybe no big thing. But when you begin to tie that we show brain change, tied to our ability to be innovative, abstract thinkers, then we begin to believe it. And that's indeed what we saw in major regions in the temporal lobe, the frontal lobes, and the association cortex. So this was very exciting uh, for us. And the paper in cerebral cortex, and also the one in Frontiers, is, was one of the most cited papers. Because to think that you build your intellectual capacity is brand new. To think about that. So now we're beginning to ask, how do we know, regardless of where someone is, that you're moving from a state of here to here? You know, for me, I don't want to go backwards. I don't want to be on that downward slope. Do you? What kind of metrics? And if we were to incentivize brain health, how will we know what that's going to look like? We're looking to see, is brain blood flow using ASL? We're not using PET scans. We're not using radioactive dye. Uh, can we look at that? So we're doing it in traumatic brain injury, concussive. I've seen, I've been doing research for almost 30 years in some of the concussion work that's uh, being studied now. And what we found was that even in brain injury, we get these significant brain changes. So for me, I'm excited about health because I want individuals brainomics because there's more people that won't have some something than will, but we've got to keep our brain healthy because that's what's going to be the drag. But what about concussions, which in America, because of the sports and the war, long, it's now one of the largest causes of disability that we're facing both now and long term. And now that we know that deficits can emerge later, we were the first to document this almost 12 years ago. If we just let the brain be and just characterize it, we will see later emerging deficits because the brain continues to atrophy because we think, oh, they can't regain abilities. These were individuals uh, that were part of our oops, sorry, uh, TBI study, and we were interested because as a whole, the group got 8% increase in brain blood flow. But then I wanted to see, it matters more if we look at you individually. Are you individually? Did you get better? But maybe I didn't. So we began to look at responders from a cognitive perspective. And what we found was the people that got the most cognitive gains were the ones that showed the greatest brain gains. So there is association between how much you're benefiting. Moderate, if they gain cognitively, only showed a smaller increase in baseline brain blood flow, and the non-adopters barely anything at all. So it may be that the non-adopters needed more time. There may, and all of these individuals uh, were at the same level of severity, and they were at chronic stages. So that's what I want you to realize, that there's really no limit to our brain's ability to restore itself. So looking at individuals, this is showing an individual that was 70, that was thinking of retiring. And he said, I feel like I'm not keeping up to speed anymore with everyone around me. And he said, do you think it would help me mentally if I retired? And I'm one of those individuals, you can probably tell, that doesn't think that mentally retiring is a good thing. Now, you can retire from taking the jobs, but maybe you can volunteer in just a complex way, and it's going to matter. Well, this individual, uh, when we look at brain blood flow, this is the frontal lobes. You can see, and this is after four sessions, two hours each, teaching them how to do abstract reasoning, innovation, not memorizing every single fact because that actually works against your higher order thinking. And they were also able to get increases 
in these temporal and parietal lobes, before and after training. So this is an area that we're just starting to look to see individual metrics, because I have this belief that if people see it that on their own, that maybe they will keep their brain healthy. So the training that we've developed has really been based on 30 years, and we've done a lot with teenagers, both in middle school, high school, and early college, uh, kids from poverty all the way to gifted kids, and teaching them in strategies of how do you process information, whether it's what you're hearing today, or is it conversations, or is it movies, or is it art? It's a way of thinking. Uh, we teach them how to not take in so much information. What we find is the smartest people are not those who take in the most and memorize the most, but it's those who are able to block inhibitors. People that know right up front, I'm not going to pay attention to that. That's who makes the smartest individuals. Today, when you're exposed to so much information from Google and all the sources, the more you read, the stupider we become. So we teach individuals, how do you delimit what you come in and go deeper on it? How do you abstract? How do you create new knowledge with that? So that's our zoom in, zoom out, zoom deep and wide for rich applications. And then innovation. Our brain was wired to be innovative. Andy Warhol said that my, his brain is quickly uh, jaded by rote. Well, guess what? All of us brain is quickly jaded by rote. As soon as you're doing the same thing day in, day out, very predictable, it's going to go backwards. And I love it that Lori's such an explorer because she's keeping her brain completely wired to do new things, unexpected. You know, that's what our brain loves to do. So every day, how much unexpected, how much new knowledge are you creating? We get individuals very excited about what they're doing. So in summary, what we found... As a result, and we've done clinical trials across a multitude of uh, populations. I said teenagers, we've done ADHD, we've done dyslexia, we've done stroke, we've done TBI, we've done early mild cognitive impairment, the early stages of uh, Alzheimer's disease, frontal temporal dementia. But this is kind of globally, we're seeing increased ability to abstract which is synthesized thinking. So if I said, what is synthesized thinking? It would be for me to point out someone in the audience say, I want you to give me the biggest idea you took from my talk. And it's got to be something that you didn't hear verbatim. You have to take in the world knowledge and create new. That's what abstract synthesized thinking is. We saw increase in brain blood flow. We saw increase in the two major neural networks, the central executive, your default mode network, and the speed of neural synchrony. So when we think about our brain slowing down, it doesn't have to. You can increase that by how you think in deeper level ways, and that we were able to get changes in white matter was something I hadn't hypothesized that would happen, and that we see these cognitive links between this. So think about how innovative you are every day. We get people, I say, with individuals, when you have conversations with your spouse or your friends or your colleagues, how much is it wrote? How much do your emails or they wrote, your subject lines? If you can kind of jump start and start doing synthesized thinking after you see a movie or when you read a book. I mean, we have bookshelves of hundreds of books that we don't know whether we read them or not because we didn't go deep on them. But when you begin to synthesize, what we've learned is that your brain, the way it loves to process information is not detail-based information. That's been shown for almost 100 years, that what our brain is wired to do is quickly get generalized meanings and abstract. And our brain gets innovative when I say create new knowledge, and it, it engages these broad-based networks that strengthen them strengthens them. So you don't get random things that are coming about because of multitasking, which I can talk to you about if you're interested on the side, uh, which totally breaks down the brain in these synchronized areas. So pl plausible explanations about why do we get such dramatic changes in brain health? 
by teaching people how to think. You know, so I think as a society, we always want to have the quick pill. What's going to make me smarter? Well, we know for our body, I can't give you a quick pill to make your body stronger. You could take steroids, but if you don't work out, it's not going to get stronger. So what about our brain? Probably with, if dopamine is going to work, what if we combine it with how you think? It's probably going to be a combination, not to mention sleep and everything else. But what we think is multidimensional increases in brain function and structure are driven by how you use your brain. So you're either weakening it or you're making it stronger. Deeper level thinking, innovation, abstraction, curious questions, but rote, it's always going to go backwards. So if you're, you love to store more information, our brains can do that. But we've actually been able to show in randomized trials, the more you focus on details, the worse your abstraction gets. We believe that, uh, and you've heard this before, it increases cellular activity and metabolic rate. They've been showing it in animal studies. You've heard this. Neurons that wire to get, fire together, wire together. And in Alzheimer's disease, they say expire together. But we want to say grow together because I want us thinking about brain health. I love thinking about what's wrong with the brain, but it, we have enough knowledge now to move to the area of understand what are these. If we have neurovascular coupling, how you use your brain is what's going to make it healthier. We need to engage in that. So these are some of the other reasons we've talked about protein and lipids in animal studies. They've shown animals that do complex mental activity, and I don't know, compared to us, a rat, how complex it gets, but they do show increase in protein and lipid synthesis, and they actually show clearing of amyloid. Our brain is probably prepared to react better to future information when you engage it in these ways. So these are areas I want you to see that we have studied. Our institute that I started almost 15 years ago, we have over 130 scientists, and everyone, their mission is to focus on not just identify what goes wrong in these different areas, but to figure out a way that we can make the brain move to higher levels of functionality. And we really are unique, uh, really around the world, to focus across the lifespan in health injury, and disease in terms of what's happening. And these are individuals that we've worked with, uh, high-performance individuals. There's the article if you're interested. We have ambitious goals. I want you to be wildly ambitious with me to solve these problems, to elevate your own intellectual capacity. I think it's always interesting. People always think about, oh, I'm not worried about me but my spouse or my parent, I want you to make it personal and make it for your teachers and everyone else, and you can read through the rest of these. We've got to expand our brain span to match our human lifespan. Thank you so much.